Okay. How okay, came on? Okay, so okay, so let's start. Okay, so um, so this presentation is actually in English, and I'll be talking about uh, production-ready HA Kubernetes clusters in 5G environment with kubevip and MetaLB. So let's just uh, get started. Okay. So this is the agenda for today. First, I'm going to talk about like what are the unique characteristics of software infrastructure for 5G, uh, that being containerization, uh, orchestration, and cloud. And second, I'll talk about the use cases. So first is the Kubernetes cluster API endpoint, and N2, which means the connection to AMF network functions in the 5G architecture. And the third one is uh, CON. So, um, it's okay if you don't understand everything right now because that's what I will explain later on, but just to go through and then I'll talk about what are the challenges that we face when trying to implement uh, like um, these uh, use cases. And then I'll talk about the tools that we use to solve the challenges and I will then talk about how we can uh, implement these uh, tools in our use cases. Okay, so let's get started. Okay, so uh, just before we get started, so how many of you are in this lecture because you're interested in 5G? Okay, so how many of you are in this lecture because you're interested in Kubernetes? Okay, and I'm gonna guess the rest of you are interested in both. Okay, so let's go continue. Okay, great. Because uh, I am a, a DevOps engineer, so I do come from the DevOps side, meaning the infrastructure, the software side, instead of the network functions. So I'm more of an engineer in software, not in network. So I'm not a net network expert. So I previously worked at Hewlett Parker Enterprise. Uh, I did uh, hybrid cloud consulting for the financial industry in Taiwan. And then I also wrote my master thesis on hybrid cloud integration at SAP in Germany. So I did my master degree in Germany uh, SAP. So um, so that's kind of my background. So uh, in terms of 5G, I'm, I'm basically a beginner, but in terms of like cloud, I spend uh, a long period. Okay. Okay, so what is unique about 5G software infrastructure? Okay, so there are basically three characteristics. Um, so the first is that it is microservice based and meaning that it's containerized. It may use technology such as Docker. So what is, what is microservice anyway? So basically in, in the before time, um, most software are monoliths, meaning they are just one software package and you install them just uh, directly. But nowadays we break uh, each uh, software into different components and then we uh, have like different teams work on each deployment and they interact with each other based on some kind of service endpoint. So they might use API calls or other uh, protocols to communicate with each other. So the benefit of this is that it's easier to scale. So if there's a part of um, software that there are more API calls to, then you can add more memory and more uh, machines to that software so that um, um, your service is more reliable. And the second is that it's Kubernetes based. So what that means is that it's orchestrated and that it uses Kubernetes as the orchestrator. Of course, there are other orchestrators, maybe such as Docker Swarm, but right now in the industry and in open source, pretty much Kubernetes has taken over all orchestration work. And the third thing is that it's hybrid cloud. So hybrid means that um, before time, most of the software are hosted in every company's own server room. But nowadays, we have something called public cloud, meaning such as AWS, um, GCP, and uh, Azure. And the infrastructure right now is like sometimes, uh, instead of using on-prem uh, server rooms, a lot of the software are going to the cloud, so they migrate to the cloud. But there are also use cases where the software needs to be hosted in both on-prem and hybrid, uh, in both on-prem and the cloud. So that means that it's hybrid. It uses both uh, um, the public clouds and their own server rooms. Okay, but uh, it's okay if you understand because I will go through the architecture right now. Okay, so this is the Kubernetes architecture. It's very 
it's okay if you don't understand what's inside Kubernetes, but there's only a few points you need to know for me to continue this lecture. So the first thing is that in Kubernetes cluster, usually there is a master node. So this master node is responsible for the orchestration of the worker nodes. So the worker nodes are where the, serv the softwares are hosted, whereas the master node is where uh, they kind of uh, talk to these worker nodes. But how does a developer or a Kubernetes admin talk to the Kubernetes cluster? It's through an API endpoint. So I don't know if you know this, but uh, there is a command called kubectl. And underlying that is actually sending API calls to the Kubernetes cluster. So every time you talk to the Kubernetes cluster, you send a command, it's actually underlying as an API call. So if that's an API call, it means that it has an API endpoint to manage the Kubernetes cluster. But on-prem, uh, if the master node goes down, that would mean that you can't talk to the Kubernetes cluster anymore, and you would lose the ability to make any changes or manage the Kubernetes cluster. So that is why high availability on-prem is important or else you would just be unable to recover the cluster at all. So this is the breakpoint that you need to think about. Okay. And the second one is uh, 5G architecture. So I'm going to uh, say up front, I'm not an expert in 5G architecture, but basically all of these um, are microservices from AUSF to AMF to SMF. And uh, um, what, what is important here is that there is a connection to AMF called N2, which, is, uh, which, is like, uh, which uses load balancers to connect to the external world. So for me, uh, that's the most in interesting part is um, with all of these services, which service needs a load balancer to talk to the outside world? So from a DevOps engineer point of view, that's what I care about, because that means I need to make sure that it's high available. So that um, if, for example, if um, one node loses connection, um, the RAN, the GNOB here, can still talk to the AMF function. So that's why um, this is important. But for everyone else, um, this is uh, why do I add like so many um, like um, uh, introduction here or like explanation is because it's for myself because I don't understand it that well. <laughs> okay, so just joking. Um, okay, so the third one is 5G hybrid cloud infrastructure. So this is not my company's uh, product's uh, architecture, but this is an open source uh, 5G core platform called a Aether. So within this Aether, you see that there is on-prem and off-prem. So off-prem here is the same as cloud. So what happens is that, um, so for example, you have like a site that uh, hosts some kind of network functions, but on, on cloud, you also have a cloud management platform that can control all of the sites. So you have to think the on-prem. So maybe you have like an on-prem uh, host that is in Taipei, but you also have one in Gulfstone. So how do you control both and interact with both hosts from one location? You would need some kind of centralization through the cloud management platform. So for me as a DevOps engineer, there's a breakpoint here. So it's that, uh, for instance, I have some kind of management website on the edge cloud that the users can go to. So then that would mean that if my nodes, my Kubernetes cluster is not HA, the users cannot like access the website anymore, and they cannot manage our node, our host uh, software anymore, so then that would be a problem. So I need to make sure the Kubernetes uh, needs to be HA. Okay. Um, okay, so basically um, the summary of that is I have three use cases. First, I need to make sure Kubernetes API access uh, stays alive, even if a node dies. And the second, I need to make sure the N2 AMF load balancing is alive. And the third, I need to make sure the management website access is alive. Okay, so three use cases, but they're pretty much the same thing. They're all just endpoints, services, load balancers that needs to be alive, even if the node, one of the Kubernetes node dies. Okay, so what are the challenges uh, here? So the first one is the one I've been mentioning a lot is uh, on-prem high availability. 
how to ensure accessibility when one key Kubernetes node is down. And the second is security. How to restrict and monitor network access in Kubernetes clusters to our services from external networks? For instance, uh, like um, in websites, you have DOS attacks, right? So if a user sends like millions of uh, HTTP requests to your website, your website will crash. And it's the same thing with API calls. So if someone send a lot of API calls to my load balancer, it might cause me not able to um, service other API calls. So that's why I need a way to rate limit these uh, calls, or I need a way to authenticate these calls. So how would I do that? And the third is visibility. And this one is unique to uh, 5G, is that I need to know like uh, from which um, NIC interface my uh, service is bind to. And the reason for that is I need to know how to debug it when my uh, when I cannot access the website anymore. I need to know where that NIC is. And also, um, there are, when I, later I would talk about the tools, and some of the tools, they automatically uh, advertise their IPs from all of the NIC interfaces, and that might cause a problem because it might interfere with other network, for network functions that are bind to other network interfaces. So um, that's something I will talk about later on. Okay. So, okay, the first uh, tool, so there are three tools uh, that can help with this. So the first one is called Kube VIP. So the Kube VIP is very simple. So basically, I have three nodes. So each node has their own IP address. So when I'm talking about node, node is just like a VM, okay? So it has like 204, 205, and 206. But then, um, usually when I want to access um, uh, Kubernetes, I might take the master node, for example, 204 as the endpoint, and then uh, kubectl port 6443, and then manage the Kubernetes cluster. But now, uh, with kubevip, I can assign a virtual IP. So a virtual IP is an IP that you do not use. So it, it, can, uh, it can be used as a virtual IP. So when I uh, use this virtual IP as the Kubernetes access, uh, Kubernetes API endpoint, it doesn't matter if my 204 goes down. I can still access 205 and 206. So that is like, it's very simple. Like I have, I just uh, reduced the, the failure, the fail, I have the failover mechanism now just by having this virtual IP. Okay, and the second one is uh, pretty much the same. It's called Metal LB. So Meta will be, it will, in this graph, you can see that I have a service, a Kubernetes service, and it has a cluster IP and a load balancer IP. So the Meta will be, um, it will assign a load balancer IP to the service. And this is all on-prem. So the assigned uh, IP here is 192.168.100.200. And then these uh, speakers, these metal LB speakers will broadcast, advertise this load balancer IP to the external client. So the external clients, they can access this service just by this load balancer IP. So um, this is how they can access the service. But if you don't have metal LB, what we usually do is that we open a node port. So we might open a node port um, like, I don't know, 30,000, and then they can access this service as well. But the problem with node port is that it is not high available. So the node port only, um, is only assigned to one of the nodes. So if that node goes down, then you're off. Like, there is no way to access anymore. Okay, so these are uh, two on-prem technologies that we can use to first recover the um, Kubernetes cluster when it's if one of the nodes down, and the second is assign a load balancer IP on-prem uh, through Meta LP. Okay, so and the third thing is a uh, con API gateway. So this is a, a little different from uh, the other two. So this one is more pertaining to the security part. So a con is an API gateway. So what is API gateway? So some, right now, um, it's a tool that we can use to authenticate and limit the API calls that goes to our service endpoint. So this is um, more of a security mechanism. And um, I think that's uh, all I want to talk about it, but I know there are other sessions that talk about it more deeply, but this is uh, one of the use cases we can use is that 
um, for all of our Kubernetes uh, load balancers, we can actually add a mechanism to supervise the uh, API access. Okay. Great. Oh, okay. So, um, okay. So, how do I implement it? So, if you're a DevOps engineer, you would know our job is really funny because sometimes people call us YAML engineers. So, what is a YAML engineer? So, basically, we go and download these YAML files called manifests. And, or Helm charts. And then we change some variables within the YAMLs and Helm charts. And then we just type uh, kubectl Helm, deploy, and then done. So basically, uh, we get paid a lot to do no logical work because there's no logic in this. It's just like changing variables, right? So I'm going to say DevOps is good work because it's actually very easy work. Okay, so, um, so there's only three steps to every implementation I will talk about right now is download, change, deploy. Okay. So the first is kubevib. Um, this is already on the website. So copy and paste engineer. And then you just, uh, but there are things I want to talk about. First, uh, actually gives you the option to use static pod and daemon set. So basically, if you want to use static pod, uh, it's a single node Kubernetes. And if you use a daemon set, it's uh, for a Kubernetes cluster. So a daemon set will add a copy of the pod in every uh, host with in every node of the Kubernetes cluster. So it'll be everywhere in every node. And the second is there are two uh, network layers to think about. One is ARP and the other is BGP. So I'm not a network person, but what's important here is that um, I chose ARP because for the BGP, you may need to do some more um, like a BGP router configuration uh, whereas the ARP, it's only about the um, lower layer MAC addresses. So it's actually easier. So after that, um, before deploying, there are two things you need to set up. And one is that you need to have a virtual IP that's not in use. And the second is that you need an, to set up the RBEC permissions. So basically, um, within Kubernetes, actually every pod, if they want to do some uh, stuff, they need to have rules, like cluster rules. But this is not important for this talk, but you can just download it this, uh, uh, at this URL and then just apply it directly. Okay. So, but uh, what's important here is that uh, within the manifest I just showed you, what are the imp important variables you may need to look at? So the first one is the VIP interface. So this is the interface that the virtual IP will bind to. And the second is address. So what is the virtual IP? And the third one is called CP enable and surface enable. So CP here means control plane enabled. And this control plane is referring to the Kubernetes control plane, not the 5G control plane. So basically, if you make it true, it will make your Kubernetes cluster API endpoint high available. And if you change it to true for service enable, it will make all of the load balancer services within your Kubernetes cluster um, like a part of the kube VIP. So the kube VIP will assign a, a IP to the load balancer if you set it to true. But here, I'm not using it for load balancers. I'm using it for control plane only. So I'm setting it to false. Okay. So after you do that, you just uh, kubectl apply file. Yeah, OK. And the second one is called meta -OB. So for meta -OB, first uh, we go and install the Helm chart. So Helm charts are just a lot, of a lot of YAML files. So it's just a group of YAML files, and then you just apply directly. So after you do that, there are two CRD API objects you need to think about. So the first one is called IP address pool. And the second is called L2 Advertisement. And uh, these are the only two you actually need to do um, high availability uh, virtual IPs. So in the first IP address pool, um, you will specify what are the virtual IPs that uh, MetaLB can use to assign to the load balancers. So here, there are three types. And as you can see, it also supports IPv6. And uh, this is just like a CIDR range that you can use. And then within this range, there's another thing called L2 advertisement. So the L2 advertisement uh, will uh, tell like, um, like what is the address pool it can use and where does it bind to the interfaces. But there are also more advanced configurations where you can choose, okay, 
which namespace can use the IPs or which node can use the IPs. But this is just uh, if you want to specify interface, you can do it here. And the other thing about MetaLB is that um, when you're doing this, if you don't specify the interface, it will advertise this IP address at all NIC interfaces. So that will may cause some problems because you don't even know where <laughs> the advertising is happening. So that may be an issue. Okay, so that's why we recommend to always um, uh, add an interface there. Okay, so and then third thing is con. So con is the same, you add in Helm chart. And uh, after you add the Helm chart, there's a CRD called com plugin. So this is just an example. So within the com plugin, there's a, maybe a plugin with the functionality of rate limiting. So I can say, okay, so how many API calls can I get per second? Five. How many can I allow for 10,000, uh, for an hour, 10,000? So what happens is if you exceed this rate, the API can ac access will be denied. So you cannot access it more. So this is just to protect your server, just in case someone wants to DOS attack your low bandwidth service or your software. And then after that, uh, you need to unnote the com plugin. So basically, uh, you need to add an annotation to the service name, which is the load balancer. You want to add this functionality. So if you add a load balancer for Metal B, uh, this, then it will cause um, the Metal B to have rate limiting functionalities. Okay. And this is all uh, very simple because uh, there's a com plugin hub where they actually just teach you how to do this. And uh, how you don't even need to write the com plugin yourself. So everything is copy and paste. You just need to choose what functionality you need to use, right? OK, so it's very, very simple, very simple. OK, um, so this is a summary. So um, this is a very short talk. So. Um, if you understand this table very well, then I think uh, you have no problem to come work at our company. And uh, so, so 5G software infrastructure is microservice-based, Kubernetes-based, and hybrid cloud. But we have some challenges. Uh, there's on-prem, high availability, security challenges, and visibility. But what are the use cases that we need to make sure uh, high availability is done? Is like the Kubernetes cluster API endpoint itself, and the N2 AMF low balancing. And the third one is management website access. And then how do we achieve these? If we can use these open source tools such as KubeVib, MetaLB, and Khan. And how do we use that? Um, that I already talked about, but basically it's just copy, paste, deploy. Copy, paste, deploy, yes. Okay, great. And uh, so but <laughs> this is the plugin. So we're hiring DevOps engineers at Ataya Lan. So you can go to our company website, ataya.io, if you want to get to know our company more and uh, get to know our company more. And uh, last but not least, so this, thank you. <laughs> this is my personal email address and my LinkedIn if you want to connect. And uh, I will be open for questions now. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> uh, you can ask in Chinese. I don't mind. I can I can talk in Chinese as well. No. Yeah.嗯大概就不到一分钟就是基本上不会有感觉的对不会有感觉对因为其实像嗯像嗯 它的QVIP port 还是会继续broadcast 对那如果是MetalB比较特别的是就是在MetalB的话呢 其实如果你是用Layer 2的话 它会选择只有一个speaker在broadcast 在advertise 所以如果你刚好死掉的node 是刚好在advertise的那个node的话 你可能要等个一两分钟 
。但是如果死掉的不是这个 advertise no 的话，那你可能更不用担心，不会有任何影响，因为还是有一个 no 在 advertise。对 ，OK， 谢谢。